Um, thank you so much for excellent presentations. I think uh, lots of issues were raised that, that we, we could discuss for hours, but unfortunately we, we don't have time for that. Um, I think uh, uh, some core themes were, were, were mentioned that, that I would like to, to maybe you would like to comment on each other, but I think the, 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 the very frank view we got here at the end about uh, interoperability. It's, it's definitely, we're, we're stronger together, but, but it's still, um, still difficult. And, and I would like, oh, I mean, that, that was the sort of the, the perspective from, from, the, from the NRF side. But if, if you could elaborate, uh, uh, Martins, on how this is perceived from, from the German side. Well, thanks very much. I can absolutely agree what you what you said. Um, we we found out that this crisis response crisis response operations we've we've done in the in the recent decade, uh, we have lost quite a lot of knowledge and capabilities to do something in the field of collective defense, and so we faced quite a lot of well struggles. In in my position, I was the commissioner for the readiness of the NRF, and we had to do quite a lot of cooperating and, and coordinating work just to get the troops ready. The, that where we got very good results, um, what it was in, in collective effort. Um, and so for the, for the VJTF next year, we succeeded in getting all the material, equipment, things, soldiers together. We will put all the, 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 the larger, larger cars, larger tanks, what, whatever you can, you can imagine, on, on certain, certain areas where they are prepared and they are ready to move from there on. We put a lot of effort in the, in the preparation of the, of the transport, the mobility. It was discussed today quite often. Um, so we, we, we ordered the, the, the ships for the for the transport, and you can imagine that having ships ready on a on a different time scale or or timelines, that is um, not inexpensive, if I may say, and and we did the same with with railroad transport, as as you probably know in Europe, all transport slots are fully booked more or less, it's more or less like the like the the plane plane slots or in, in above uh, middle of Europe. And, and so to have, to have the trains ready available, you have to book them in advance. So, so this is something we, we did for the, for the next year. And, 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 and therefore, Germany really is convinced that we have to do more in this field. We have now one brigade ready for deployment for next year. And we want to be ready in 2023 to have one of our brigades ready from scratch so that we do not have to prepare things, to coordinate, to, to put things together, take it from other troops to this brigade, to the, to the Lehrbrigade 9 with um, uh, commanding officer Ulrich Spannut, with whom I spoke on Friday and he was really enthusiastic about his experience with his brigade in Norway, having done this, the, the deployment and the cooperation and the, the, the experience we, we had with Norway as host nation. And what you, what you said about, about the, the movement within Europe, um, earlier was mentioned, it takes, I think you, you said it from the, from the American perspective, 30 days from one from Spain across France, the, the Netherlands, somewhere, Germany, especially Germany with its federal structure, is, is quite a challenge. We, we aim at five days, and probably in the US Defender exercise, we will have to prove that it is possible to, to do it in a, in a, in a time frame. And the, the previous US commander in, in, in Europe, General Hodges, always said, do it faster. <laughs> And, but it's, it's really a challenge. It's a challenge within the European Union, it's a challenge within NATO, and it's a challenge within Germany as a federal state. Mm -hmm. and, and Andrew, you, you said that this was uh, um, 
a one-shot one force. But uh, what are, what, what's the thinking on, 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 on the follow-on forces? Could you elaborate on that? Because that interests at least us, us in Norway, as I mentioned uh, in my introduction, the, the scenario that something happens elsewhere and, and the NRF is involved. What, 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 what's the, um, the, 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 the plan, uh, plan then? The, the follow-on forces as such are the, those remaining forces that nations held in their national inventories that they are prepared to make available uh, to NATO under Article 5 as what they believe is needed for any particular operation. Um, and the only forces available to SACIA year on year are the NRF and the things that go with that. All the rest belong to nations, and they, are, they hold them at the various degrees of readiness um, that are required of them through the NATO defense planning process, um, which is something which is reviewed every few years. There's a, a review going on now um, in the cycle of NATO defense planning process, which may possibly, I do not know, um, ask nations to, in, to hold more forces at higher readiness as, as, we go, as we go through this process. But that is the follow-on forces. It is nations who own them, it is nations who train them, it is nations who decide where they're going to go, and as things currently stand, it's where nations, uh, nations deploy them. Um, so my worry in all this is where does NATO get into the fight? Mm -hmm. um, and particularly on the land, sea, two side, and this is where I, I, was, I was taking a few notes with the, my colleagues speaking. Um, if we do not know where nations are prepared to send their land forces today um, if, if a problem occurs, then it's very difficult to have a fully blown training regime for the headquarters through the command structure into the force structure that necessarily makes sense. Now there are measures going on at the moment um, in ACO to change um, how this looks over, over, over a time period and we wait to see um, what this comes out as but I think there's a notion that we might see um, some stronger or or, or the sense of affiliation as we go forward, but even then that still is, is potentially fraught with political um, issues um, as well. Thank you. Uh, Sabag? Let me just uh, add uh, one, one comment so it's uh, clear what I meant to say. It might have been misunderstood. The uh, NATO Response Force or the uh, VGTF Brigade is fully interoperable and is ready to engage in operations. So when I spoke about interoperability, I spoke about interoperability in the land domain in general, where we still face challenges when it comes to the, the other forces, just to be sure that I'm clear on, on that one. Yeah. Sorry for me, I don't want to hog this, but again, I think the, 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 the point that uh, General Soberg makes there is entirely relevant. But also what I took from his presentation is the fact that it was a five week um, exercise for integration and training and preparation of this force and this comes back to my point about how long it takes to get ready um, and th 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 this is this is a problem that is uh, more peculiar for the land domain than for the other two domains uh, without a shadow of a doubt and when when um, uh, the Commodore, whose surname I can't pronounce, I apologize, sir. Um, so I'll just, call you, I'll just call you the Commodore, if I may, uh, for now, talked about uh, being ready now, um, and I was disagreeing. I think we were talking from, or my mind I was disagreeing, from two different domains. It is, I think, an easier thing to be ready in the, in the maritime and the air domain than it is to be in the land domain. Um, not least because through our history of NATO in the Cold War years, we had centralized um, uh, multinational air and maritime forces, but in Germany, we were lined up in national corps, all eight of them from north to south. So land was very much seen as a national business rather than a multinational business um, through at, at that level. Let's hear, uh, hear what Gröning said there. Uh. Yeah, I think... Um, it's important to underline that we have been through these 25 years of uh, pure expeditionary. Everything was deliberate. I mean, now we are entering again into a situation which is extremely dynamic. The threat back in some days were also very dynamic, but today the threats again are very dynamic. I mean, so when you uh, look at this environment, uh, it's important that interoperability 
becomes dynamic. Everybody gets connected together again. You establish command relations between NCS, multinational headquarters, uh, allied headquarters, and you start the reporting, uh, reporting process. I mean, uh, we were all flying around or sailing around with a NATO flag in our ma mast every day um, some years ago. Interoperability was never an issue. We had the same SOPs, we had the same doctrine, we had the same crypto, we had the same frequencies. So when we mm. met uh, a US warship in the middle of the Atlantic, there were no issues. Mm. Now we don't have that persistency. And please note that word persistency. Persistent operational activity and persistent command relations. That's a word you will find in, in the NCS adaptation process. It is extremely expensive to fix interoperability afterwards. Mm. If you fix it up front and you operate together, well, it's normally not uh, an issue. So, so if you look at NCS adaptation, if you look at the force structure adaptation that we are starting on uh, now, and hopefully also the political adaptation, you will see the word persistency used in two different meanings persistent operational activity because of the persistent or the dynamic security situation and the persistent command relations because we can't act as we are taking over forces from allies and using them somewhere. No, we have to leverage these command entities that are out there who know their forces, who know their weaknesses, uh, etc. So the mindset has to change in every respect as we uh, modernize uh, the alliance. I, I know we're all anticipating uh, Professor Tomne's final remarks, but we, we need to hear a couple of questions from the audience as well. Are there any any questions out there? Yes, please. Uh, let's uh, find a microphone. Thanks. Uh, yes, I have one question. Uh, you all mentioned the importance uh, of uh, rapidly respond to crisis as well as readiness. Uh, so my question is, if NATO is uh, ready, why do we need like forces like the Jeff? Did you understand? Let's, let's have another one before before you you answer, uh, uh, Robin Alves. Okay. We heard many times the importance of 360 degrees for Germany, for all NATO, NATO allies. Uh, what does it mean with regard to capabilities? Are we there? Are we, uh, or do you perceive uh, the commitment, the pledge to invest in intercapabilities uh, as big when it comes to maintaining the expertise and the capability uh, for crisis management operations uh, as the focus on collective defense. Are we, are we ready to be as excellent 360 degrees also with regard to, to capabilities? Great, and one final question from... Uh, it's really for uh, Dag. You talked about validation. I, I'm interested to know who validates you. Um, is it the people who've experienced this dynamic threat? The Syrians, the Iranians, the Ukrainians, the Georgians? Uh, those from Chechnya, or was it people who've been through the same expeditionary era of, uh, you know, NATO alliance members? Okay, three, three great, great questions. Who would go first? Arne Morten, and then, then uh, Andrew, and, and then Sobek. Yeah, I'll certainly try, and the question about the NRF is extremely uh, interesting. Uh, so is uh, the expeditionary uh, question. So, so as I said in my uh, introduction, we have the quick fix in Wales and uh, was to apply some of the things that we have used and developed over the last uh, 20 years to fix a collective defense problem. That caused severe concern in the alliance. So where, for example, uh, would the deployable NCS headquarters go? Where would the NR, uh, NRF go? Uh, and allies understood that we only have one deployable headquarter, we only have one deployable force, and that's not good enough in a collective defense uh, perspective. So I think what you will see now, what you're both po pointing to, 
uh, is that you will see that the force structure has to um, uh, has to fix both of those challenges. Does that mean that the NRF will go back to its roots? I mean, be a deployable force? I don't know, as you build up the readiness initiative, but it has already been decided with regard to the uh, NATO command structure that it will, be not will, it will not be deployable anymore. So the joint force commands are not going to deploy anymore. And the reason for that is, of course, that allies ask, so where are you going? To the Black Sea or to the Baltics? And some Norwegians up here are really worried that we won't see NATO at all. So uh, that's why we have this new approach, a regional approach with regional uh, responsibilities. And we will likely see an adaptation process in the force structure as well to, to meet that challenge that you are uh, suggesting uh, we have. Andrew, please. Um, I'll address all three questions a little bit, if I may. Firstly, the question you raised about the GEF. Um, it is organizations like the GEF which give you the scale of force you need. Our enlargement process of from eight, 16 to 29 in the last how many years it's been has been accompanied by an absolute downsizing of our militaries. And I think as uh, Christian Molling, who's here tomorrow, famously said in 2012 that if European defense spending continues to go the way it is, we'll end up with uh, 28 bonsai armies, small, nice to look at, but essentially useless. So it is bringing them together, gives you that scale, and makes them all useful again. I think a better example than the Jeff of doing this is the German framework nation grouping, which is seeking to talk about divisions and cores rather than brigades, multinational air task groups, um, and a Baltic Sea presence. I think it's a much better example to use than the Jeff in this context. Um, the, the 360 degree notion, this is, I'm probably going to get fired now. Um, Collective defense capabilities are what we need to invest in because we need to be ready for Russia. We have demonstrated we can do the non-Russia things over the last 30 years, and we do the non-Russia things when we're ready to do them uh, because we own that timeline. Uh, my own, and this comes from my own experience. When we used to go to Northern Ireland from Germany in the British Army of the Rhine days, we would train, deploy to Northern Ireland for how long it took, uh, six months, then come back. Training to go to Ireland took us about two months. Training to come back from Ireland to get back into the all-arms battle took us about six months uh, because of the difficulty of doing these things as opposed to the fairly simple um, uh, uh, life of a, a green soldier on a counterinsurgency operation. So that is where I come from. The validation issue is a very interesting one. There's lots of discussion on validation in NATO at the moment. I'll let the general talk about who did it on this exercise. Um, we sp spend a lot of time talking to the Ukrainians um, without a shadow of doubt. Uh, we're also um, having many discussions on red teams, which are not just conventional Russian red teams, it's other red teams as well. Um, how far that goes remains to be seen, but we are at least alive to it, <laughs> if nothing else. Okay, let's hear a final remark on validation, and then, and then we, we have to draw the line. Okay. And uh, mm, let me then, I will then only address the, the direct question here from uh, Professor Roberts. And uh, as mentioned here, the validation is a very formal process. It's, uh, I, don't, I won't mention how many criteria, but a huge amount of criteria that we need to show that we are able as a headquarter to perform. There has been some work ongoing in order to uh, make this uh, more updated with the challenges and what we are facing now. But uh, I would agree that this is something that we really need to dig into and see if NATO can afford to be doing this also in the future because it takes a lot of resources. Well, we were validated, yes, by another NATO headquarter, by people and officers and soldiers who have gone through the same process as we have. But uh, there's no doubt that uh, NATO has uh, still some work to do within uh, that domain. Thank you. I, I, I forgot it was impolite of me, sorry. Thanks uh. very much. I, I, I would just concentrate on the capabilities, your, your question. Uh, it's, not an, it's not only a question of capabilities, but of capacities. For example, from, from our perspective, we, we shrunk for the last 20, almost 25 years. 
So now we, we try and we are in the process of, of rising again in, in numbers and in procurement. And so at the end of the year we will, we will touch 172,000 soldiers. But it's really a challenge. We, we intend to go up to, well, that's uh, decided so far, 198. Uh, which is which is really a challenge because you all can imagine what's on the on the on the market and we do need IT specialists we do need technicians engineers and so on so so therefore and and I think this situation will will apply for all for all European armies either either NATO countries or European Union it's more or less the same situation um, you, you can argue that it uh, might be easier in the, in the eastern parts due to economic situation, um, but this is one of the challenges. And, and therefore, it's one solution from, from my point of view that we do things, more things together. As I, as I mentioned, with uh, procurement, for example, with, with Norway, Germany, the Netherlands, and, and France, to concentrate on, on, on some of the countries which whom you do more mm. to just to, to integrate and you mentioned the the example in the uh, with the german and and netherlands army with the integration of the almost or the, the 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 major part of the netherlands armored brigade is now integrated in a german division and it, it's working as far as i can see it as a naval officer working really well mm. so we are we are we are moving on in this in this direction, but then you can't, or you you are not to 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 lose to lose all the other countries because you need the common effort, mm. and this is one of the challenges we face. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. I suggest we put our hands together for the panel, and invite Rolf Tamnes to the floor.